Welcome to a new episode of Talking About Roots. Today with Kelvin Martin, BWF and Badminton Panam Empire Assessor. On behalf of Badminton Panam, welcome to all this presentation, which is a first of more to come. First, I would like to express our sincere wishes that all of you, your families and communities, are in good health and following the required prevention indications like social distance, working at home, among others, and the required prevention while we have these times. We know these are difficult times for all of us. And let us, and we at Badminton Panam want at this moment to reach out to you, our, our technical officials group. We want to keep in contact, we can we'll keep you informed about some regulations, guidelines, so you are all updated and ready for our return to normal status whenever that is, and we hope this in a short time. Thanks to Ricardo Salamanca, our events director, for this initiative of developing this activity. To our technical official chair, Mr. Enrique Charadán, no, for supporting this activity totally. And now, let me introduce now our presenter for today, Mr. Kelvin Martin from Barbados. Kelvin is our assessor for Badminton Panam and also for BWF. Among the nominations, the important nominations Kelvin has received in the past are participation at Olympics, at Commonwealth Games, at Pan Am Games, and then Super Series Finals in Dubai. So you know that all the experience that Kelvin is carrying with him, and he's very eager to uh, share with us today. Kelvin, thanks a lot for your being with us today. I'm sure we will enjoy a very nice and very educative uh, presentation, and I leave the floor to you. Thanks, Kelvin. Thanks, Ricardo. Thanks very much, Herman, for that. Um, it was kind words. Um, I also echo um, your sentiments to our um, TOs all across the region with regards to staying safe at this time. Um, I think it's a good initiative, good initiative on the behalf of Pan Am to try to share some information um, with the technical officials. Um, one of the mandates that we have at the international level is to try to share as much information with the continental um, technical officials so that um, we are all working towards the same high standard and one common standard. So hence um, the Badminton World Federation has been very proactive in the last couple of years in trying to ensure that there is information out there which can be accessed by the technical officials which um, will help them to see you know where where we are and where we are going um, the document that we are going to be reviewing here this evening which is the ITDO um, again is one of those um, documents and the whole aim of that as I said is to try to ensure that badminton is being appreciated the same way, whether it's at a junior, um, national, or local tournament, or whether it's at the, um, the bigger stage at, at the international level. So I just want to share some information with you with regards to where some of that information can be accessed. Okay, and as I mentioned before, the purpose of the, um, the ITPO um, to standardize the presentation of uh, badminton matches, to have uniformity in interpretation and implementation of the laws of badminton across the globe. Where can these and other materials be found? Some of you might be familiar, but again, we are trying to ensure that everybody has access to information. So if you go on to the, um, the BWF um, site under um, the URL 
corporate.bdf.com you will then be able to access um, the various bits and pieces of information unfortunately it's not all put one place in one location so you will not have to know where to go to find this information so under those um, the heading of corporate statutes uh, chapter 2 ethics you'll see players code of conduct and players code of conduct is important because you know again that is part of the admin the laws of badminton and if you're going to be administering the laws of badminton you need to know exactly what it is that players can and cannot do then there's a technical officials code of conduct and again that spells out you know what is expected of a technical official and the do's and don'ts um, 226 coaches code of conduct and that is where it spells out what a coach can do at the court side so when you're umpiring you need to know exactly what it is that the court is permitted to do at court side so that you can then enforce the rules as necessary code of conduct in relation to betting as technical officials you are not allowed to bet on matches so then it's all spelled out there for you Under the same heading, um, statutes, you have chapter four, uh, where you'll find the rules of the game. Section 4.1, the use of the laws of badminton. 4.1.1, instructions to technical officials, which is what we will be reviewing here um, in a few minutes. Section 4.1.5, vocabulary. 4.1.8, instant review system. Still under the heading of statutes, chapter 5, general competition regulations. And again, general competition regulations that so what the various countries are allowed to have in relation to advertising and, and so forth, and what type of advertising is allowed um, for each um, stage or uh, different levels of events. And in some instances, there are some countries um, which have special permission to have extra logos on their shorts and shirts and dresses in the case of the female. And the section 537 just gives you a summary. So there you can go on and you will see whether it's mandatory or optional for country name, player name, and so forth to be on um, clothing. And under a slightly different heading, um, you'll see under officials and click on umpire, umpire's downloads. And under um, umpire's downloads, you'll see COC uh, cocktails. And this is the BWF official magazine. And it's done on a quarterly basis. And not just because I am featured in the last um, edition. Uh, but it's a very useful um, magazine to keep on top of because in there you actually have articles from the BWF um, technical officials uh, committee chair and also the umpires assessors chair and the referees assessment panel chair as well so they also deal with some on court situations in that magazine so it's a very useful magazine to um, you know, keep on top of so you can access that as I said on the officials on pairs and downloads all right so that brings us then to the meat of this evening's discussion all right the document basically is set out in various um, areas and it starts with before you go on to court while you're on court, what is expected when you're on court at the end of the match, and then some other general advice. So I will just start by going through um, the first section, section five.
and I will read some of it and just um, you know gloss over it and then just emphasize the areas which I think we need to pay some particular attention to. Okay, so 511 it says I'll pay in the score sheet from match controller and fire coordinator and ensure that the specified number of line judges and the applicable court attendants are present. And a lot happens during the, this area because this is where you're going to be expected to check players' clothing to see whether they comply with the regulations pertaining to the particular um, event which you are officiating at. So this is done during the marshalling um, area where you are introduced to the players. This also is the area where you will have an opportunity to have a quick chat with the players and the, the sort of information that you will be trying to gather from the players during the marshal and area would be the appropriate pronunciation for the names. And again, that is a very important um, aspect of officiating to be able to, as close as you can, be able to pronounce the players' uh, names properly and to introduce them in a manner in which they want to be introduced. Um, as you are aware, there are some cultures where um, your surname comes before your Christian name and then in others, the normal routine of your Christian name then they are followed by your surname. The sheet also, the way it's printed, it would actually give you an indication as to which player or which team of players actually would be first when you march on to court. And so you pay attention to that and that will help you then to position the players in the correct order. Moving on to section 5.2 before the match on court. Carry up the toss purely and ensure that the winning and losing sides exercise their choices correctly in all six. And once confirmed, that they are noted. Get into the umpire's chair as quickly as possible after the toss. Start the stopwatch and then time the warm-up period unless instructed otherwise by the referee. The two minutes Warm-up starts when the umpire sits in the chair and ends with the calling of play to start the match. The umpire shall call ready to play to instruct the players to get ready to start the match at 90 seconds of the two-minute warm-up period unless otherwise instructed by the referee. Now, there are situations where there will be variations to when you are expected to start the, um, the match. And this instruction invariably will come from the referee. And this information is usually um, given out at the umpire's briefing, which takes place um, prior to the actual uh, staging of the event. And just to share some of the reasons um, why you might have variations, um, particularly on um, television uh, court, the time allotted for the warm-up sometimes is not enough time so that the announcers can do the various announcements introducing the players and providing all the necessary background information for those who are following um, on television. So sometimes you might be instructed that rather than starting at 90 seconds, that you actually start at two minutes. Right? So again, it's important to listen to what is expected for that particular event um, that you're at. And if there's any difference from um, court to court, the important thing there is that the timing of the interval starts when the umpire 
gets into the chair and sits down. So sitting down automatically, the first thing you do, start your stopwatch. Because that is when the official timekeeping starts. The other sections there deal with, you know, noting the information on um, your score sheet so that you know who is serving and who is receiving. Section 5, 2, two four, check that the line judges, chairs, and coaches chairs are correctly positioned. And it might become an issue sometimes where a coach might move the chair into a new location and by doing so they might be blocking the line judge from seeing or blocking the advertising that's um, at court side and you know that that could be a very um, serious um, thing there so you need to pay attention to ensure that once the chairs are placed in a particular position, coaches just sit down in the chairs and not move them around. I guess most of us would be familiar already with the standard way of announcing, so I wouldn't spend any time any time there. Um, just going back to the start, start, to the start of the match. One of the important things there that we want to emphasize is that when you make your announcement to start the match, you announce the players, and then you take a break, and then you say play. And the reason for taking that break and saying play is that we are trying to get across the fact that play now becomes an instruction. So you're now saying to the players, play. So if you you just make your announcements and include play in the same sentence without the pause, you know, it's just that you are making an announcement on a sentence as opposed to instructing the players that it's now time to play because you are the person who is in charge of the game. So you are telling them now it's time to play. So that's an important um, part of officiating that is looked for, um, you know, by us when we are doing the assessments and appraisal, that you're actually instructing the players to play at that critical point of the start of the game. During the match, And it says here to use a standard vocabulary in WF statute section 415. So hence why I was trying to ensure that you know exactly where to find these regulations. And what you would have all been familiar with and being told before to record. And then call the score. Next one, 543, um, again, during the service, if a service judge is appointed. Okay, right, so just talking about section 542, and reference there to when IRS is in use, observe if a challenge is being made before calling the score. This is a very important point to note. So you wouldn't know if a player on either side is challenging unless you are watching them. So it now becomes second nature that when you are on a court with IRS, before you actually go to record the score, you need to have a look at both sides to ensure and to confirm that, you know, there's not a challenge coming from either side of the court. Section 544, which just speaks about being aware of the status of any scoring device and inform the referee in case of malfunction. There are times when sometimes there might be problems with um, the signal in a hall and the scores that 
you have on your scorepad might not be matching what is displayed on the monitor. So it is important to keep an eye on the monitor and make sure that there are no issues with regards to what the score is and what is actually being displayed. And if necessary, to actually call for the referee to have it rectified and also to notify the players that there might be some difference between what is being displayed and what the actual score that you are announcing is. There's a particular section which seems to have generated some discussion before section 5493. And it reads a fault occurs on the laws 1321, 1322, which are obvious. 1331, which the line judge calls and signal suffices. Or 1332 to 1335, unless clarification is needed. For the purpose of spectators, when one of these faults occurs, there have been some changes where the expectation is for the umpire to announce what the fault that has been committed to the spectators, to the players. And there's a bit of vocabulary there which talks about flight. And there have been some instances where some persons have interpreted to mean that if the shuttle hits the net during service, that the service judge should be given a signal uh, for fault and that the, the umpire should be announcing flight. But that was never the intention. Um, so I know that that is being worked on now to try to make the necessary amendments to all of the rules and regulations so as to erase that ambiguity which seems to be listed there. Okay, so most of the items there you would all be familiar with and you know your, I would encourage you at your time to read through and become very familiar with what is listed here. Five five extended game. And this is just to reiterate that um at the interval at the point where the score becomes twenty nine then you need to announce the game for both sides, so it's 29, game point, 28, 29 all. So you need to announce the game for each side, and then the game then finishing at um, 30 points. Section 5 six, end of each game. The game must always be called immediately after the final rally of each game has been decided. And you see being decided there highlighted. And that could be with regards to whether there might be a challenge from IRS, um, which means that although the rally might have finished, you will still be waiting then for a decision from IRS then to finally decide whether the game has actually come to an end. So the reason for that highlight there being, being decided. After the games, we would do the usual announcement. Um, first game won by, uh, and after the second game, second game won by, uh, whether it's um, a team event or an individual event. And uh, 564 at the end of each game, the umpire shall request the court attendance and judges to wipe the court. And this is becoming a standard requirement now so that, um, you know, when the game recommences after the interval, 
there's no delay because the court is wet, right? So you try to do all of that during the interval to ensure that you can resume on time and you can get the players to um, recommence during, um, at the end of the, the interval period. And again, ha having referred to the player's code of conduct, you would then realize that at the end of the match, the players are required to shake hands with the umpire and the service stretch. So that information would be, as I said, we enforce the player's code of conduct and the goodwill formalities which are supposed to take place at the end, end of the match. And we will continue with your usual announcement, match one by, uh, depending on whether it's a team or individual or whatever. In the interval between game at 100 seconds, call the court number if more than one court is used, 20 seconds, and to repeat the call. The usual vocabulary there to start the game, the second game, and then there's a third game, what you're expected to call. Okay, so we've come down to section 5 7 uh, after uh, the match. At the end of the match, the umpire shall note the end time the duration of the match and the quantity of shuttles used on the score sheet if used. 572. If any incidents happen on a court that may be reported by the referee after the tournament, and what they're saying there that um, depending on the incidents that take place and are written down on the score sheet, the referees will then be compiling and uh, recording and uh, reporting on that information when they submit their reports. So they're, they're trying to minimize the trivial amount of stuff that has to go into those reports. So it's only the important matters that you actually end up having to write onto, um, onto the score sheet. So generally, again, at the umpire's briefing, the referee will confirm, um, you know, under what conditions they would actually want you to have the score sheet printed and then brought to them for them to sign off on. So it's not every incident that needs to be recorded. And it's sort of, when you highlight below, there's says examples of incidents that do not need to be followed up with the referee after the match include a clothing violation which was rectified by the player, an injury not resulting in a retirement, or suspension of play due to a minor repair to the court or its surroundings. So although the referee might have been called um, to the court, it's not every incident that needs to be noted and then reported at the end. Line calls. The umpire shall always look to the line's judge when the shuttle lands close to a line and always when it lands out, no matter how far. The line judges are entirely responsible for their decision, except in instructions 582, 583, and 584. And that's where you may have an overall situation or an IRS fall. Now, one of the critical things there to bear in mind is that you will sometimes have a situation where, depending on when the, where the shuttle lands on the court, it might not just be one line judge whose call is important. So it's important not just to acknowledge one, but to acknowledge both line judges. And I'll just repeat that. 
we need to acknowledge both languages when there's a situation where the shadow lands cross to um, two languages. Section 5A2 um, deals with certain situations. So it says there, if in the opinion of the empire, it is beyond a reasonable doubt that the line judge has clearly made a wrong call, then the empire shall immediately call, and the vocabulary is listed there, correction in, if the shuttle landed in, or correction out, if the shuttle landed out. And again, the important thing there is to make that call immediately, and not wait to be influenced by spectators or to be influenced by players. There will have to be a case where, the, in the opinion of the umpire, they clearly see that you know the shuttle has landed differently to what the line judge has called. And within that section of the law, they're then empower, empowered, sorry, then to take the necessary action to make the correction. Section 5A3 um, deals with um, where there is no line judge, so if there is no line judge, or if a line judge is unsighted, the empire shall immediately call. And again, you will see highlighted in section 5A331, as the IRS, IRS indicates, the empire shall call in or out as appropriate. The score or service over, followed by the score and then play. If the IRS indicates no decision, the umpire shall call let, followed by a score, and then play. So the important thing there is if the IRS is unable to make a decision, whatever call was made stands. So it might be a case where The line judge didn't see where the shuttle landed, so they called unsighted. The umpire can now ask for a review so that they can then call on the IRS to determine whether the shuttle might have landed in or out. And the important thing there is that whether the decision is in or out, Neither of the sides are penalized for the umpire asking. It's a case of that there's a tool last year to be used, and the umpire can use it in that case where they themselves are undecided to determine whether that was in or out. So it's not just there for the players to use, but it's also there for the umpire to use as well to help to arrive at making the correct decision. And the emphasis there is on making the correct decision. And just some technical clarification in 58333. If the IRS decision ends the game, the Empire shall call game, followed by the appropriate call as in instructions 562, 563, 565. The important information in that section would be not to continue now to announce whether there are one challenge or no challenge remaining. The game has been decided, so there is no need then to continue the routine of announcing whether um, there are any challenges remaining. So that's that's what's to be garnered from that section there. Um, the empires are called here. Yeah. I'll just read again section 584, um, which might clarify what I was trying to say earlier. Where an instant review system is in operation, if the call by a line judge instructions the H3 and H4 are called or overruled by the umpire, instructions 
5-2-5-3 is challenged by a player. Law 17, 5-2, um, we have your statute section 401F. The empire shall ensure that the player has a valid right to challenge. The player must clearly say challenge to the umpire and make a clear signal by raising the hand. So to emphasize the information that's being um, conveyed there, you have to ensure that the player has a right to challenge and just to confirm that you have an unlimited number of challenges until you get two challenges wrong. Right? So there's no limit to say that you can only challenge 10 times. You can challenge as many times as you like until you have actually exhausted two wrong challenges. And then at that point, it means then that you have no challenges remaining. So then, therefore, um, whatever request you make will not be acted on if it's the case where there are no challenges um, remaining. And just to continue, um, after the player has observed the call made by the empire or line judge, if a line judge changes the initial call, or the umpire or rules a line judge's call, the umpire shall make the players aware and permit the challenge made immediately thereafter. The instructions for challenges is that um, a challenge is to be made immediately. And there is still a certain amount of flexibility with regards to the statement immediately. And an example would be a case where a player might have observed that a shuttle landed in their particular situation, um, maybe out, not paying attention to the fact that the line judge has called in and, you know, might be in their mind convinced that, um, you know, they have won the rally, so they're not paying particular attention. And, only after maybe the umpire might have maybe announced the score and the player realizes, hey, you know, it's not what they thought it might be and they might then make an appeal. So you might have had a few seconds going by since the shuttle ceased to be in play and the umpire making the decision to call the score. But in a situation like that, it would be acceptable to actually accept a late challenge from a player under circumstances like those. So it's not a case of, um, you know, like a player has consulted with his coach who has asked him to challenge. There might just be one of those situations where what happened and what the player expected to happen was two different things and they didn't realize what happened until some time uh, expired. And that then gave them the opportunity to make a late challenge. Now, section 585 just goes on to say if there is a right to challenge, the umpire shall call the name of a player who challenges, regardless of whether it is singles or doubles match or team type, all in or out as appropriate, and at the same time raising the left hand above the head. And the raising of the left hand above the head is a case of raising your hand up directly above your head and not just raising your hand, raising your left hand. It has to be directly up, you know, so that it's clear that you are asking for IRS to review um, something on that match. Just going back to the actual challenge itself, the player has to indicate to the umpire that they are challenging. And they can do that by either verbally saying challenge or raising, um, you will see that they will raise their racket up to indicate to you that they want to challenge. So those are the two normally 
observed means by which uh, the player would indicate that they are challenging. And just back on the paragraph, there says the player must clearly say a challenge to the umpire and or make a clear signal by raising the hand. So we see an image there of an umpire raising his left hand in the air to indicate that there is you know, a request uh, for a challenge review. 586, the instant review system will review the original decision and indicate to the umpire the result of the challenge as either in or out or no decision. So for those of you who have not had, yet had an opportunity to officiate at a tournament where there is an IRS um, system, after the IRS team has reviewed the footage, they will just simply come back to the umpire to show in or out. And Again, this is where the umpire net needs to be in full concentration when the result of the IRS decision comes back because you will need to know whether the original call was in or out in order to now determine well whether it's a successful challenge or not a successful challenge. And just to share some of my own experience with regards to this, I found it initially challenging to try to remember what the call from the line judge was. And I sort of developed a little system for myself where I realized that um, when the player challenged, if the player was challenging on their side, it meant that the call was in. And if the player was challenging across the net, when I say across the net, over on the opponent's side, invariably the call would have been out. So with that little technique, it took a little bit of pressure off when the actual result came back from the IRS because you can quickly remember who the player was who was challenging then to realize well okay well if it was that player on that side then they would have been um, challenging in if it was on their side and out if it was on the opponent side that helps you to get a little bit of time to be able to quickly analyze the information that's come back now from IRS in and out, how you're going to process that in your mind and then make the correct decision in terms of the announcement that you make and then finally in terms of awarding the point to the correct side. Because in my experience I have found that it is a lot to process in a short space of time and you know, especially if it's not something that you're doing on a regular basis, you know, it could some getting new stuff. And I found that that has worked for me, and I have shared that information with some others, and it seems to work for them as well. I did seven goes on to you know say what happens if a challenge is successful, the empire shall all correction in or correction out as appropriate. The score or service over, followed by the score as appropriate, and then clear. So while the IRS is reviewing the footage, there's actually a break in the match, which means that you now have to announce play at the end of the announcement of the score to so instruct the players to resume playing. So at the end of every IRS um, decision, the announcement of the score concludes with the instruction 
Section 5871, if a challenge is successful, and that ends again, the Empire shall call correction in or correction out as appropriate, GM followed by the appropriate call as an in instruction 562, 563, and 565. Section 589, if the instant review system indicates no decision, it shall be elect if the original call is uncited. Right? So important there. If the original call is uncited, it shall be elect. Otherwise, the original challenge decision shall stand. So if it was the case of that the Langer that call in and the IRS was unsighted, the call remains in. Right? The original challenge decision shall stand. Moving on to section 59. Specific situations during the match. The Empire shall keep a careful watch for the following occurrences and leave with them as instructed. I wouldn't bother to read too much there, um, other than maybe section 5915. A player attempting to influence <coughs> or intimidate the service judge or a line judge in any form, audibly or visibly shall be reminded that such conduct is unacceptable if law 16.7 applied if necessary. Five nine one six um, just reinforces um, the current situation with regards to the throwing of sweat. A player throwing sweat otherwise contaminating the court and its immediate surroundings I'll be reminded that such conduct is unacceptable if law 16.7 applied if necessary. Right? So uh, we are all aware now that um, we are no longer allowed to throw sweat on the court. And, you know, if there might be a situation where some of the older players who might be accustomed to doing that, you see it happen, you would immediately invite them to use their towel to reinforce them that when you want to um, wipe your sweat, use your towel as opposed to throwing it on the court. Section 510, players leaving the court. The umpire shall ensure that players do not leave the court without the umpire's permission, except during the interval described. So again, generally speaking, when the player wants to go off court, they must get permission from the umpire. It is no um, accepted practice for a player so quickly go to the basket, grab the towel, wipe the sweat quickly, and return onto the court without having to ask the umpire's permission. And that is permissible. Uh, the only circumstance under that under which that might not be permissible and you might have to remind the player that they need to get your permission to do it is if it's in a situation where it might be a tactic being used by a player to delay the game. Under normal circumstances, you will see that, you know, at the end of the rally, before the other side is ready to serve, the player darts off quickly, does a quick towel, and come back ready to play. And you will get situations where a player during that time 
might think that they can also have a drink. And that's where you as the umpire will ascertain your control of the match by reminding them, no, the permission is only for towel. And you might, when you're coming off, you might say a quick towel. Or if you see them reaching for a water bottle, you simply say no, back on court, and you instruct them to get back on court. So what I was saying there just now is born out in section 5 which says during the game, if players not on duty held up, the players may be allowed to have a quick towel or a towel and a drink at the discretion of the umpire. If the court needs to be wiped, the player shall indicate to the court attendance where mopping is needed. The player shall be on court as soon as the wiping is over and before the attendance to leave the court. So again, sometimes it becomes necessary to ask the players to show the attendant where they're uh, actually asking to be wiped as opposed to just going off the court and then leaving it then um, for the attendant to uh, try to find you know, where the court is at. Coaching from off court. Um, you can have a quick read there. I mentioned before that is a coach's code of conduct. So on the 5-12 bit, you need to familiarize yourself with exactly what that coach's code of conduct is. Um, you will then be able to um, determine whether the coach is appropriately retired um, for being at the court site. Change of shuttle. Change of shuttle during a match must be fair. That's the important thing there. It must be fair. Injury or sickness during a match. And it's important there is that the tournament doctor may be called to a place prayer only once a particular player per match, except in the regular intervals. So just to reiterate what they're saying there, during the match, the player can ask the umpire to call the referee, who will then in turn call the doctor. And if it's a case where they have some injury that might need to be sprayed, they will come and they will do it. But that will only happen once during regular play. Other than that, there will have to be a situation where it is done during the interval. Because under no circumstance is the match to be delayed for the doctor to come to spray a uh, player for a second time. Blood flowing injury, uh, I guess most of us are familiar with, um, so there should be no bleeding. Five one seven misconduct. Players are expected to behave themselves in a, a certain manner on court, and if um, you know they fail to behave in that manner, they can then be dealt with in accordance with, with Law 664, uh, where they either give them a, a yellow card as a warning or a red card as a fault. Hi, um, Kelvin. I submitted my question to you via email. Um, could could you discuss the topic for us, please? Uh, yes. All right. So the question that PJ submitted to me was in relation to what happens um, at the the net and the explanation that is currently being advised to from the assessors to the umpires is the only person who can be faulted at the net is the person let's describe the person who is making the stroke 
as the player and the person who is on the other side, let's call them the defender. So we're saying the, the player is the person who is actually executing the stroke and the defender is the person who potentially would be trying to, to block the stroke. The only person who could be faulted in that situation is the defender. So case in point, there is a exchange at the net. The defender might have played a weak shot at the net and the striker now has an opportunity to come in and execute whatever stroke they want, whether it be a smash, whether it be a clear, whether it be going cross court. The laws clearly state you cannot obstruct a player from making a legal stroke where on the execution of that stroke, the striker's racket goes over on the opponent's side. So again, to be clear, the defender is the only person who can be faulted at that point in time. And we are saying clearly it's a case where that the striker has hit the shuttle on their side of the, the, um, the net and following their, in the racket follows through over. So it's a clear legal stroke on the side of the striker. So they're going to make contact with the shuttle on their side. And the law says that under that circumstance and that circumstance only could their racket potentially then go over the net on the other side. So to be clear, it's not a situation where there must be a collision between um, players' rackets. The whole intention then is to not wait until that there's a, a collision, but to actually call fault immediately to stop the potential for the collision right so to reinforce the point it's not necessary for there to be a collision and this all has to happen close to the net and once that is clearly understood it's a case where and you see it often where a player makes a weak shot and then they stick their racket up hoping that when the person hits the striker hits the shuttle that it will hit onto their racket and then rebound over on their side in an attempt to win the point. The ruling is that that's not allowed. So anytime you see the player at the net raising the racket up, you don't have to wait for a collision. Fall on the side of the defender. I hope that's clear. Yes, Kevin. Thanks very much. You're welcome, PJ. Hi, Kelvin. Can I follow up um, on that question? Specifically, um, it is the discretion of the umpire what is deemed to be close at the net in terms of the defender because sometimes there may be, may be an instance where um, the follow through of the player's racket when they hit the stroke um, may not necessarily impact with the defender's racket, but they may have still put up the racket relatively close to the net. Mm -hmm. uh, in order to reject the uh, shuttle. So I'm just trying to understand, um, is it the discretion of the umpire there as to what would be deemed close? Yeah, well, I guess I guess the reality is that is a very subjective um, determination because a further clarification on, on that is being worked on where um, they, they will add to that in the opinion of the umpire. So the umpire has to be of the opinion that the defender is close enough to the net to potentially um, obstruct the striker from making a legal stroke. Right? And, you know, as I said, there have been all sorts of suggestions that maybe the player might have 
rather than smashing to go over that they might have probably go cross court or whatever but once that there's a there once there's an opportunity the striker cannot be denied the opportunity and as you said it's all hap it all has to happen close to the net because you can imagine that if uh, a player is far enough away that there's no potential then to obstruct or block them you know if you're halfway down the court at the back of the court obstruction and blocking doesn't come into play and i mean just to give you an addition to that it could be a situation where the striker executes a legal stroke and his racket goes over the net the defender on the other side might not put the racket up and therefore commit a fault the defender might be skillful enough to return the shuttle from close to the ground and listen carefully so the, the defender is returning the shuttle close to the ground so therefore they're not obstructing the player but in doing so the defender hits the shuttle up and it hits onto the striker's racket what happens in that situation and the clear answer to that is although the striker was in a legally strong position when he followed the racket over in the execution of the shot he had no right leaving his racket over the net so the mere the mere fact that the, the defender now hits the shuttle up and it's onto his racket he's now committed to fall is that clear or do we need to further clarify that yes please that's very clear thank you kelvin mm -hmm. I don't know if anyone has uh, any other questions in relation to this point, but I just wanted to know, um, in relation to the scoring device, when you're using the IRS system, uh, does it note the amount of challenges left in the event that an uh, umpire forgets uh, how many challenges um, any one give a player or side would have made? Uh, yes, yes. The, um, the scoring um, device um, keeps track of the number of challenges. So it starts off, um, you start off with two and you, you can go as long as you, you don't have two unsuccessful because when you have one unsuccessful in when the, um, when the result come back from IRS, you have two buttons to press. One is, um, successful and unsuccessful and then it automatically then deducts one if it's unsuccessful so the, the machine will indicate to you how many challenges are left okay thanks again and just to be clear the challenges are always on the face of the, the scoring device or is it that you have to press some buttons to find out how many challenges remain yeah well they're always there and it's a programming um addition so you will find that at a tournament um they might only be using irs on maybe one or two courts and those machine those scoring devices that are used on those will have those two extra um buttons um on them for the challenges and you know okay. while we're talking about challenges just want to reiterate a point there to you know the umpires among us who are experienced enough to be officiating at the international level and who also hope one day to get to the stage of going for assessment that it is almost mandatory now for them to have experience using the scoring devices as a person who just like um the majority of you are from you know a region where that experience doesn't come easy 
and not 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 just easy but doesn't come at all unless you actually go out to a tournament um outside of our jurisdiction i am trying to ask the bwf to see what they can do with relation to maybe having some kind of virtual training opportunity for persons to practice before they actually go to the tournament. Thank you, Kelvin, for your participation. And thank you all for attending this meeting. Uh, we hope to see you soon in our next Talking About Rules uh, Badminton Panam Technical Officials Conference.